Introducing NASM One, NASM's ultimate membership program. Unlock access to everything your fitness career needs to succeed. Unlimited CEUs, free courses, access to our premium app, and exclusive discounts. All for thirty-five dollars a month. NASM One is best-in-class tools, cutting-edge certifications, confidence in your craft, and everything you do as a personal trainer made easy, so we can achieve our greatest goals together as one. Well, hello there, listener. Welcome to this week's episode of the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. And at the end of every show, I ask you to send me your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, feelings to info at darlene.coach. And I always respond. I've always responded to everybody who shoots a question about the show to that email inbox. And when I was a teenager, I always dreamt of hosting one of those radio call-in shows. I was a big fan of Delilah, still a big fan of Delilah. Uh, I love Dan Savage's uh, Relationship Advice Podcast. And so today, for this week's episode of the show, I'm going to make my own dreams come true and go ahead and respond to some of the questions that I've been getting so far this year at that inbox. And if you hear me on this episode and you've got a question that you would like covered on a future episode, you just go ahead and shoot me an email. Okay. So let's get to it. Let's just make some of these dreams of my own come true and answer some of your burning questions. These questions generally what I've been getting so far this year have been a lot about how we manage our coaches or how we manage ourselves as coaches, how we handle some common problems with our clients, and then also a few about what we do for ourselves. And I want to start it off with this email from Jenny. And it's this email from Jenny that actually made me want to do this episode. So here we go. Jenny writes, I have two clients who are really down on themselves due to their health and weight. They've said, I'm so fat, or I already have a double chin, or I used to be able to do such and such a when I wasn't fat. And I can think of countless other examples I've heard, and I know it's not uncommon. Many people feel down on themselves and either are seeking affirmation or condolences or I don't know, maybe it's something else. Anyway, I struggle with how to respond and how to give some attention to these comments. My natural response is something I'd say to my kids, but I have no clue if this is correct. Something like, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not a good feeling, but you're working on it now and let's work hard and work smart. But is that enough? Is it wrong? I have one client who I know needs far more than personal training. He needs a therapist. And well, that I am not. But is there something better that I should say? I appreciate your advice and thank you for your podcast, Jenny. Well, shout out, Jenny. Uh, I responded to Jenny directly. I also let Jenny know that we we're going to be doing this episode. So thank you, Jenny, for your question. And I think it's a common one that lots of well-being focused coaches are struggling with. And you know, if you listen to the show for a while, you know that it's a weight neutral show. We buy into the idea that diet culture, as we have been taught about it, just isn't real and true. A lot of the things that we have been taught to think by media, by health media, uh, by some common fitness industry ideals, just aren't accurate. And so if you're new to the show, let me just unpack this idea that diets don't work, that we have been taught that if we restrict our calories, we can decrease our body weight, and that that body weight will then remain stable at a new low point. And all we've got to do is have the right kind of calorie restriction and the right kind of willpower. And then magically, we can reshape our physical selves into a new state. And the reality is that science has been looking for decades, and we have no scientifically validated way to decrease someone's body weight and have it remain that new low point for longer than 18 months. And if you doubt that, go ahead, go back to last year. We did a three-part series with Rich Fami about diet culture, fat bias, the BMI. We cover all of the science as we currently understand it. Okay, so if we recognize that diet culture isn't really real, that it's kind of a big lie, but then we also have clients who are coming in and they're talking about their weight. 
They're talking about feeling bad about themselves. And they're also maybe exhibiting some mental health struggles. What do we as practitioners, as whether you're a wellness coach, a health coach, a personal trainer, a different kind of fitness professional, a positive psychology practitioner, if you are a person that holds space for someone else's process, how do we respond? And so I'm actually going to take this question backwards. At the end, Jenny talks about a client who she says needs far more than personal training. He needs a therapist. And well, that I am not. So the first thing that I would throw out there is if I have any client who I think needs a mental health practitioner, I let them know that. And during my intake and consults, I tell my clients from the jump, I am not a mental health clinician. I am not a medical practitioner. That's not what I do. And so if ever we're up on that line, I'm going to tell you the same way I would tell you if I thought that you had injured a joint and you needed to go get an MRI, if you were sick and I thought, ooh, you know, what's happening in your body doesn't actually make sense, you might want to go get that checked out. To not do that for someone's mental health is like training them with a broken arm right? There's something off that you know is outside of your scope of practice. And so an ethical practitioner is someone who's going to make that clear to their client, but do so in a compassionate way. And knowing that that is something that happens sometimes with the clients that I work with, because we are working with their well-being, their bodies, I'm often working with people who have chronic illnesses, or they've experienced, you know, shame and guilt with other practitioners. I tell everyone during intake that I'm not a clinician, I'm not a health you know, practitioner, I'm not a doctor, my job is not to diagnose or treat any mental or physical health problem, that I'm always going to let them know when I'm up on that line. And so then when that happens during sessions, when we get to the point that that's a thing, the conversation will sound something like this. So first off, I asked during intake, are you working with a therapist? Have you been in therapy before? That is part of my standard intake for everyone because I always want to know what's the landscape that I'm working with here. Just like I'm going to do a squat assessment, a movement assessment, and I'm going to ask them, well, have you ever broken a bone? Have you ever had a surgery? To me, the mental health questions are the same as the physical health questions. I got to know what I'm working with. So if I've got a client who's already working with a therapist and something comes up in our session, I'm not going to say, oh, no, 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 we can't talk about that. That's for your therapist. I'm going to do the harm reduction strategies. And harm reduction strategies are just like, you know, if someone sprained their ankle, but they have to keep walking, I'm going to tape it or brace it, right? That's harm reduction. Same kind of ideas. So I'm going to hold space for the emotional challenge that they're having in that moment. I'm going to validate those emotional reactions. I'm going to help them understand their intense emotions. And I'm going to make sure to say, you know, this is really something I need you to talk to your therapist about. Most of the time I know their therapist's name. So I don't know, let's say their therapist's name Stephanie. I'll, I'll say, I think I really need you to talk to Stephanie about this. When is your next session with Stephanie? To put it in their mind that this is now time bound. This is now an accountability factor. And that I'm serious that I need them to do that. Now that's for the clients who have a therapist. For the clients that don't have a therapist, when that moment comes, I will remind them, do you remember during the consult when I told you that I would always tell you if I thought we were up on the edges of what I really should be professionally doing and my qualifications? And of course they will say yes. Be like, okay, I know that it's not comfortable to hear this, but I really think you should consider getting a counselor, getting a therapist, talking to someone about this. Are you open to talking about what kinds of therapy you might want to look to, or I will give them some kind of guidance based off of my professional experience, not my personal experience, right? Because professionally, I've invested the time and energy to understand different psychological strategies and what might be helpful. Or if I'm not sure I have that information, what I'll ask them to do is go speak to their general practitioner, right? Their physician, because that person should have all of the tools available for what is going to make sense for that client. So that's the mental health piece. That's the second half of Jenny's question. But now let's talk about the first half of Jenny's question, where Jenny asks about the way that clients will talk about themselves and their bodies in negative ways. 
Because there are, I think, two separate questions here, right? There's the mental health piece when I'm aware that, yeah, I think maybe this client needs more than a wellness coach or needs more than a personal trainer. And then there's the, the, the subclinical, right? The things that is probably not a mental health problem, but a client who is saying things like, I'm so fat. I used to be able to do this other thing when I wasn't fat, right? They're fat shaming themselves. And to recognize that that's what this is. This is internalized negative ideas about the body that they're in now. And, you know, a lot of weight neutral coaches, a lot of anti-fat phobic coaches would say, diffuse that, push it away. You don't want to feed into it. But I actually think that that's the wrong advice. And this is why. To me, one of the most important things that I could do for someone who's experiencing a difficult emotion is to validate that that emotion is real. And if you want a real deep dive on this, you want to go listen to the episode we did on gaslighting yourself and your clients. Because any emotion that you are having is a valid experience in that it is yours, right? Emotions are inherently subjective. And so if I'm having a bad day and I just tell myself, I'm not having a bad day. I'm not, I'm not, it's not happening. Nope, that's not it. I'm not upset. All I'm doing is denying, dissociating, pushing it down in a way, which means I'm not actually dealing with the problem I'm having. And yeah, maybe that's not a big deal if it's like a little problem, but if it's a big, big problem, I got to recognize, I got to pull that in. I got to validate it. I got to appreciate the efforts I'm currently making. So there's a four-step process that I use as a coach. I use this as a manager, as a practitioner. I used to train this communication style to my baby trainers and my baby coaches uh, back when I was managing. And it starts with just recognizing that the person brought it up and validating that emotional experience. So I'm going to say something, you know, if the client says, um, you know, I used to be able to do the such and such when I wasn't fat, I'm going to say, you know... <laughs> I hear you. You've been you've been making comments like that about your body a lot lately. And I, you know, it sounds like you're really uncomfortable emotionally. Like, is that something we could talk about? Or I might say something like, you know, you've been really hard on yourself for lately. Can we talk a bit more? And what I'm looking for there is consent. I'm looking for permission. Is this client going to let me in to dig in a little harder? And then what I'm going to do is pivot to what the current research on shame tells us. And shame is when we have internalized the idea that it's not that our behavior is bad, it's that we are somehow bad. Like I as a person am bad. That's the difference between guilt and shame. So guilt is when I have a bad behavior and I should feel bad about. Shame is I am bad, right? I am fat, I am bad, right? That is what this person is implying when they say I'm so fat. The research on shame tells us that talking to someone that we trust, who we can be vulnerable with, who will validate our experience and help us to understand ourselves better and let us know that we as a person, your internal, authentic, genuine self is not wrong or bad, is the most effective way to deal with shame. So when our clients are saying things like, Ugh, I have a double chin. I used to be able to do this and that. I'm so fat. And it's in a negative way. What they're looking for is our validation that they are not bad. And so we can validate, like, I know this is really uncomfortable. And then we're going to take a page out of what Jenny's already doing, right? So the client says, yes, it's okay. We explore the emotional experience together. We validate. And then we also can say, but you know what? You're taking steps to be healthier, to take better care of yourself, to move your body more. You're doing the things. And so even though you're uncomfortable, you are, and then concrete progressive steps of the actions they are taking to take better care of themselves. And then I would offer, is there something more that I could be doing to support you? And if I make a commitment to doing that, I better follow through. Because anything that I commit to my clients, I got to follow through on or I'm breaking that trust. So all of that is to say that Jenny sounds like she's doing a pretty good job of holding the space for her clients, validating their experience, 
giving them appreciation for the proactive things they're already doing to make progress. And of course, I'm sure Jenny's a great trainer is actually showing up and doing whatever she commits to the clients that she's going to do. You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm Darlene Marshall, and today I'm answering your questions about coaching, about working with clients, and about yourself. So let's keep it rolling because this is a lot of fun. All right, next one is from Issa, and it's about business management. How did you choose your niche, and where do you see the most needs in the market? How did I choose my niche? So for anybody who's not a coach or a trainer, uh, anybody who doesn't run a business on the internet, the common advice that's given to new coaches, to evolving coaches, when you rebrand, when you're doing your thing, is you got to pick a niche. You got to have your slice where you're like, this is what I do. So you're not only going to be a wellness coach, you're going to be a wellness coach for new dads who are having self-esteem issues or whatever. Um, and so how did I pick my niche? Well, when I first became a trainer, was after five years of working to recover after a chronic illness diagnosis. I had been in my early 20s. I'd been really, really unwell and been told that I wasn't going to get better. And through lifestyle practices, I was able to build my resilience, my personal fortitude, my physical strength. Um, I changed my nutrition, my, my sleeping, like kind of the whole kit and caboodle life reboot over about five years. And that led me into fitness. And I knew that I didn't want to be what I call a sexy fitness trainer. I didn't want to work purely off of like, how do I make you more sexy? What my friend calls six pack abs. Um, I knew that what I wanted to do is help people build quality of life when they had some kind of health issue, like what I had gone through. And so I always advise my clients when, or my mentoring students, like your niche finds you. What are you passionate about? Who do you care to help? And so for me, you know, I never have done any like bodybuilding coaching. I've never tried to make runners faster because those things don't speak to me. Athletic performance, bodybuilding, that stuff just doesn't sing in my heart. And so if I were to spend all day coaching other people on doing that, I would be miserable. But I could spend all day long talking to people who are struggling about their well-being, or at the time I was a brand new trainer, I could spend all day analyzing people's movement, developing corrective exercise protocols, teaching them those protocols, figuring it out when it didn't quite work the way it was supposed to and tinkering with them. Ugh, that was my jam. So my advice, choosing your niche, what chooses you? What gets you amped? And then instead of focusing on, you know, where do you see the most needs in the market? I don't know that that is, to me, the optimal question. Because what I would advise a, a new trainer, a new coach to do instead is once you know what you're really into, then you want to ask yourselves, okay, like, what is the client that I'm coaching? Who is the person I'm trying to help? Where are they looking for me? So back when I was in the gym coaching new trainers, I would ask those trainers, okay, like, who do you want to work with in the gym? And if they say, uh, I want to work with women who think um, cardio is the most important part of getting fit, I want to teach them how to strength train. They're like, okay, well, where are they going to use the gym? Well, they're going to be on the cardio machines. So then the next question is, how do you get the person on the cardio machine to talk to you long enough to show them that you know how to help them? And once you can dial that all in, where is, who do you want to work with? How are you going to help them? Where are they looking for you? You just got to get them to talk to you. That's the next trick. And so then you get the question of like virtual versus in person and kind of all those other factors. But that to me is the equation. You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Darlene Marshall, and I'm answering your questions about coaching, about client management, and a little bit about yourself. Next one on the list is an anonymous one. She asked me not to throw her name on the show, but she says, I've been doing some health coaching. It's always referred by a clinician, so by a doctor or nurse. And I love it, but weight loss always seems to be part of the conversation. How do you handle that? I need the work, so I don't really have the courage to just turn them away, but it doesn't, it just seems to always be about weight. 
And thank you for the question. And we already set the stage a little bit for this question earlier in the episode when we talked about the fallacy of diet culture, that this idea that I'm just going to bring down my weight and, you know, I'm going to calorie restrict and then the weight comes down and then I'll be fine is a big fallacy. And I want to add another layer to that, which is around the fat phobia and public health thing. And again, you can always listen to last year's episodes if you want the real deep dive on the science. But generally, it's the idea that weight is not actually a very good indicator of health for most people. Um, Yes, there is a certain threshold where increased weight starts to correlate to decreased health outcomes. But that threshold tends to be a bit higher in the data than most people think. And so just bringing down someone's weight doesn't necessarily improve their health. And that, and I'm trying to remember the statistics right now, but I want to say it was 40% of people who are BMI-wise considered to be in a healthy range are metabolic, have metabolic disease. Uh, And now, depending on whose data we look at, um, You know, I've seen estimates as high as 97% of the U.S. population has some kind of metabolic dysfunction. So you could be a totally normal weight and be unhealthy. You could be a high weight and be healthy. And so this question about health coaching, right, this is a person whose job it is to help implement the healthy lifestyle behaviors that will help someone deal with their um, chronic illness. But when the person comes in, they're focused on their weight. So the first thing that I am very upfront with my clients about the weight thing. So if a client comes to me during the consult and they say, you know, I want to hire you as my coach because I want to lose weight. I will tell them straight up what I've already said in this episode, that there is no scientifically valid weight loss strategy that works over an 18 month time horizon. So Even if I help you lose the weight, I have no way to guarantee that 18 months from now, it's going to stay off. And then I explain to them how metabolism works. So I'll say something like, when you lose weight through calorie restriction, you're not just losing body fat, you're also losing metabolically active tissue, you're losing muscle, you're losing organ density, you're losing bone density, you're losing all of the good stuff that helps the body work right, not just the bad stuff. Um, and decreasing body weight doesn't automatically equal health. So what we could do, and this is what I'll tell the client, is focus first on building a healthy metabolism, which if we're successful, is going to improve, and I'll list health markers. So blood pressure, A1C, insulin sensitivity, right? Whatever their health condition that caused them to get the referral in the first place, I will tell them, these are the lifestyle behaviors. Building a healthy metabolism will help in these ways. And it is possible that your body fat will come down. It is also possible that it won't, but you will be healthier. And then I leave it to them to decide if that is something that they want to do. Because ultimately, as a coach, it is not up to me. It is up to them. It is not my job to convince them or to manipulate them. But to back to this question that I think is really important for us to recognize, this question ends with, how do you handle this? I need the work so I don't have the courage to just turn them away. I don't turn the clients away, regardless of whether or not I need the sessions, the money, the income. I'm just honest with them and I let them decide if I'm the right coach for them. If they really are like, no, all I want is my weight to come down. I don't care about that other stuff. I will I will then tell them I'm not the right coach for them because for me personally, ethically, I will not only be very, very mad at myself if I were to try to weight manipulate them, uh, but the other thing is I'm going to hate every single session. And I know for myself that when I hate sessions like that, even if it's only one session, if I had six great sessions that day and I had one awful one, it will make me have a bad day because I will feel bad about myself like I am lying to the world trying to mess with that person's weight in an unhealthy way. And I know from the other clients I've worked with, from the 
13 years I have been doing this. And early in my career, I didn't know what I know now. So I thought calorie restriction, hard exercise. Yep, that's how you change weight, right? Like that's the recipe, exercise and move more. I would see clients have a great six months and then a year later, they'd be heavier than where we started. And I couldn't understand why. And so at first I thought, oh, they're lying to me because that's what I was told to think by the fitness industry. Clients just lie. And then I got to know those people really, really well. And I knew they wouldn't lie to me about this. So what else is going on? And fortunately, I continued to grow and get new education and watch the industry evolve and eventually learned that we didn't know all the things that we thought we knew. And we thought we were so clever. And in actuality, there's a lot more going on than exercise and move more. And it's far more nuanced and complicated than most clients think. And even most practitioners will admit. So those that is my complicated answer <laughs> to this question. Um, but that's what it is. I'm just straight up with the clients. So like, I know that I can make you healthier through lifestyle practice. I cannot guarantee that your weight will change. It's very likely your body fat percentage will change, but that's not going to show on the scale in the way you think it will. But it will make you way healthier, way happier, way more confident, stronger, faster. Your joints will feel better. You'll sleep better. Your A1C will come down. Your blood pressure will improve. Like if they still at that point care about the scale, that's not the right client for me. All right. We got one more. Let's do it. This one's from Danielle. I've seen some of your content about goals and intentions and the difference between the two, but like, what should the relationship between the two be? Which one's more important? So thanks, Danielle. Thanks for the question. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen the content I have over on Instagram, I talk about goals and intentions a fair bit, or I did at the turn of the year. Um, and generally the way I describe it is goals are destinational. They're outcome oriented. They're measurable. They're about what we want. We can make a timeline. We can make a clear plan because we can control the variables to get that goal. So let's say my goal was I want to finish a half marathon and I know how much running volume I have right now. I can pick a race. I can pick a time. I can write a program. I can commit to that program. I can build up my volume and I can run the, the race, right? Like that's a clear outcome oriented goal. Um, intentions are directional, right? I don't know the outcome, right? If goals are destinational, they're about where I'm going. What if I don't know the goal? What if I don't know the outcome? I just know kind of what direction I want to grow into. I want a feeling. I want, um, you know, a certain exploration. I'm curious about something, but I'm not sure exactly what it looks like. So maybe it's, I want to be healthier in my body. I want to feel good in my body, but I don't yet know exactly what that means for me. Or maybe it's, I want to eat better, but I'm not sure yet what the details look like. And a lot of times with fitness stuff, with wellness stuff, we set goals as if they are outcome oriented, as if we can have a plan. So weight is another great example, right? A good goal would be um, an uh, action-based goal. So it could be, I'm going to exercise three days a week for the next six months. That's a great goal. But to say, I'm going to hit a certain goal weight, and I get almost like angry whenever anybody talks about goal weight, because you can't control all the variables. We just covered that, right? But I could have the intention of feeling better in my body and then let that unfold. And so if my intentions are directional, my goals are destinational, which one's more important? Neither. What's important is that my goals need to be something called self-concordant. You know, the, the coaching industry, the self-development industry, the self-help industry, like they like to tell us all the time, you got to have goals. Goals is how you drive achievement and accomplishment. That's how you be successful. Bubkiss. Setting a bunch of arbitrary goals is a way to feel like your life is meaningless. Um, earlier today, um, I was on a call with Martin Seligman. He's the founder of Positive Psychology. I am a teaching assistant for him this semester at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was talking about the way in which that people will treat the tools of positive psychology like a formula, 
okay, I, got, I need more positive emotion. I need a little more accomplishment. I need to access flow states. And he said, that's not actually how he would encourage you to think about it. What he would encourage you to think about it is these are all the different dials that I could pay attention to depending on what's important to me, what's meaningful to me. And so if I set goals that aren't meaningful to me, they're not going to feel like accomplishments. They're going to feel like obligations. But if I take the time to explore with my intentionality, with my directionality, to really look at what do I care about most? And I set one or two really meaningful goals. I'm going to be more gritty. I'm going to have better problem solving. I'm going to have more positive emotion. I'm going to feel better about myself and about what I'm doing because those goals were self concordant. They were aligned with my authenticity with who I am and what I want and what I find meaningful. So don't buy this idea that I got to have a bazillion goals. And it's not that goals are more important than intentions. It's that I use intentions with my clients to explore what's out there. Who are you? What do you actually want? And then once you know, then get aggressive about your goal setting. We're going that way. And we're going to get there on this timeline. Here's my project plan. Here's my behavioral goals. Check in those boxes and get there because it's so self-aligned that you don't have to remind me. I want it. Uh, So to me, that's the relationship. The intention is the current that carries the boat. The boat is the goal that's going into port, right? The intention is what carries me energetically, emotionally, mentally to get the thing that I need and want. Neither is more important. It's not hierarchical. They have a co-supportive relationship. All right, that's your questions. Thank you so much to everyone who wrote in. If you have questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, feelings, or feedback, now you know that I want it even more than you thought I did. So you can email me. It is info at darlene.coach. I am Instagram. That is also darlene.coach. You can find me on LinkedIn. If you're a fan of the show, I hope that you subscribed. I hope that you would write us a review. Your five-star reviews help us to game that algorithm or share the show because that's one of the best ways to help it grow. Thank you so much. Take good care of yourselves and be well. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.